What's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the 12 game main slate that we've got here on Tuesday, uh, May 2nd. Big day, big slate, and a lot of arms on the mound here that we can consider. Some really interesting spots. Um, early projections are up and loaded to the site. Um, we've got a couple aces on the mound, for sure. Garrett Cole, Joe Ryan, Zach Gallon, definitely. Um, and some future aces, maybe a Hunter Brown and some cheapies down here, Mason Miller. And a young kid, Bryce Miller, on the other side of that Oakland game, making his Major League debut. Uh, decent stuff down here as well. Um, so a lot of ownership coming to these cheaper pieces because naturally they allow you to get to some of the the big guys up top. Um, so some interesting pitching decisions that we could thus make in the mid-range. We'll, uh, we'll get into the numbers here. Um, like I said, 12 games, so we don't really want to want to dilly dally too much. Um, but a, a quick overview is we're gonna have to probably just make some. We'll, we're definitely gonna have to make some decisions with who we want to play on the mound, right? But I don't think we're gonna have to be terribly concerned with ownership, at least in the judging from the initial looks. Um, got a, some guys in some bad spots that we'll probably uh, be able to easily stay off of, I think. Um, but, you know, notably, like an elevated ownership number on uh, Julio Urias here, full 19% getting Philly. Um, nice price tag for Urias, but not a, a good spot. Philly also gets Bryce Harper back tonight. So, um, you know, we might be able to pivot to the mid-range here. And really in the mid-range, you could see in the early projection runs, uh, there's, what, 12, 15 guys in the uh, in the exact same range here, anywhere from um, 12 points up to about 15 or, or 16. That's, um, that's a pretty condensed range here. And in the pricing spectrum, that range is all the way from Mason Miller down here at 57 up to uh, Freddie at Coors Field. So um, some interesting and some upside spots here in the mid-range. So if you do choose to play a chalkier stack, I mean, it's a full 12 gamer. You don't really have to worry about that necessarily. Um, and and you need to get off of some of the, the guys up at the top for pricing concerns or ownership concerns or whatever, then I think you can we can mix in some guys. Uh, there's some playable spots here in the mid range to allow us to get different, and um, it'll allow you to get really different because nobody's playing any of these guys. So uh, that said, let's just kind of get into it since we got so many to go over, and we will start right here at the top: Cleveland and the Yankees. Um, Man, Booney really torched this game yesterday. Uh, Domingo Herman was great. The The Guardians were not great. Um, kind of typical of Cleveland, right? They're just a bad, bad offense. They're very... They don't strike out a lot, but they're super undisciplined at the plate. Um, pretty poor approach from them, top to bottom. A lot of swinging early in counts. And that allows opposing starters to keep their pitch counts low and get very efficient on the mound. Uh, allows them to work to their good secondaries. And we know that, in particular, uh, a Garrett Cole has a, a great arsenal. Um, we're really only scared with Cole when he's starting to spray it a little bit and get on the barrel because he'll give up some power. And it's mostly to the left side. He gives it up in the air to the left side. 070 ground ball to fly ball, 36% hard contact rate. Just 1.4 homers per nine, but a 167 ISO. It is notable, even though they only hit for a 177 average or so. Um, we're not worried about Cole, right? E even attacking Cleveland because the lineup is so poor. 
early going this season, 740 PAs against righties, 83 WRC+, plus, 19% K rate, yeah, they're not whiffing, and they're walking at a 10% rate here. This is kind of why we were going after Domingo, or considered going after Domingo Herman yesterday, because he gives up a lot of power, but they just don't hit for it. 114 ISO, 27% hard contact rate, low line drive rate, a lot of ground balls coming in from Cleveland over here, and um, as you mentioned, just a, a very low upside lineup, and we're certainly not going to be going after Garrett Cole with Cleveland. Um, there's a couple of guys that, that could get to him, yeah, notably a, a Josh Naylor or Josie Ramirez, of course. Um, Stephen Kwan could make it difficult on him at the top of the lineup, but we're not terribly worried about targeting Cole. The only thing that we've had we have to consider here today with him is the price tag. It's 11 five. Uh, the ownership is actually going to it's gonna come down because we've got so many guys that we can play today. It's going to be probably hovering at this 30 percent range uh, unless we for some odd reason get a scratch on like a, a Joe Ryan or a Zach Gallon or something, um, which would force all the ownership back up to coal. But the projection is going to, it's going to be north of, um, you know, well north of 20 points here, and he's going to lead the way in that category. So there's nothing wrong with Cole. He's been excellent this year, and he's actually dialed in the homer problem. I call it a problem, um, even though the aggregate homer numbers at a buck 23 per nine are not terrible. Um, he's really dialed it in this season so far, and the suppression has been great. He's been, I mean, he had one difficult matchup against Toronto where he only struck out four, went five and two thirds. But this is the second time he'll see Cleveland, and he didn't strike out a lot of guys in that outing, but he still went a full seven, and that, that was serviceable. Uh, from a real life standpoint, certainly not in DFS when you're um, you're paying 11.5 for the guy, you can't have 18 DK points and, and really be thrilled. But um, the upside for Cole is still there. He can still go six innings and strike out nine Guardians over here. But the the lineup is just so weak. Uh, we saw even yesterday that a far lower upside arm in Domingo Herman can really keep these guys off balance with good breaking stuff. And he's got a good curveball. And Cole has two breaking pitches that he can use, the slider and the curveball. He's got the change, cutter, and the four-seamer as well. So he's got a much better arsenal than Domingo Herman, And I think you can be pretty comfortable targeting some Cole on the mound here today. Uh, he's... Definitely one of the few guys that's got 40 in the tank. And even in this matchup against anybody in baseball, he's got that in the arsenal. So um, generally on full 12 game slates, I'm not thrilled about paying this much for a starting pitcher. Doesn't really matter who it is, but, and, and certainly in, in a very bad strikeout matchup. Um, so you don't have to go to Cole and that's, what's going to keep his ownership number down. There's so many other guys that we can play. You don't have to, do this but it's uh it's perfectly playable and there's nothing in the arsenal or the batter ball profile um that would really shy or make us shy away from targeting cleveland in this particular spot uh cole still's got a 32 percent k rate uh 30 percent to both sides it's just the lefties that he can get a little bit um a little bit shaky with sometimes but I mean, Cleveland is just so low upside that we're not terribly worried about that. Don't be surprised if, like, he he kind of shits the bed a little bit here and, and Cleveland surprises you and, and gets a couple bombs. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's fine to, to be playing Cole. Tanner Bybee on the mound. I, I like this, though. This is one of these cheap arms. Uh, we didn't mention in the opening, but 6,500, he was fantastic in his debut against the Rockies. Um, went, I believe, five and two-thirds, struck out, ooh, what, eight or something? Um, let's see. Yeah, struck out eight and five and two-thirds, just gave up the one run, and it was early. He was excellent in his debut, and we've been targeting the Yankees, and the Yankees officially lost Aaron Judge. He is on the DL, so, um, this is 
this is a very low upside lineup over here in New York anymore. Um, Anthony Rizzo has not been excellent. He's, he's been walking still, but uh, the contact and power number is not quite there for him. Glaber's been great. DJ perhaps getting a little bit healthier now. They've got him as the four-hole hitter, but they're they're banged up pretty good. And they've got Willie Calhoun, Ozzy Cabrera, IKF. They had to call back up uh, Franchi Cordero, who for some ridiculous reason is still not in the player pool because uh, DK is just kind of clowning around. Um, so these guys down here at the bottom of the lineup, there's some strikeouts that we can go after. IKF obviously doesn't strike out, but uh, DJ doesn't strike out. Glaber not so much either. Um, so it's an interesting spot because we've been targeting the Yankees really all year, but unfortunately they're missing one of their high strikeout bats and that's Aaron Judge. So that, I mean, it, it's Judge. We don't, we'd much prefer to go after a lineup without him in it. Um, but is it, it is in terms of raw strikeout stuff, a downgrade. 24% K rate in aggregate so far, 89 WRC plus, but they've been very underwhelming. 161 ISO, 291, 298 Woba. Hard contact, yeah, but most of that is is going to disappear now. It's going to be some pretty medium contact, medium plus now, uh, with the absence of Judge, Stanton, Donaldson, still missing Harrison Bader, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we can go after the Yankees if you land on a Tanner Bybee. I think he's one of these guys in the cheaper range that you can target. Uh, the stuff will play at this level. Now, we can't judge any anything here in the arsenal. Like, this sample's uh, just too short so far. Um, but as with, we'll talk about this quite a bit today, as with any young arm, the only concern, like it, it's not the stuff necessarily if they make it to this level. They've got the stuff to play at this level. It's the command. It's controlling, working off of the fastball early in the count and throwing early strikes that allows you to get to the good secondary pitches. Um, now, even in underwhelming kind of minor league lineup for the Yankees here, they can still make a young arm pay if he's not throwing strikes earlier in the count. So that's where we'd be worried. Uh, Price-wise, I'd rather get to a couple of guys cheaper, but so would the field. And the median projection so far seems fine. It's a really good number for a guy down in this range, and he's going to be popping in the value score for us. So uh, he's a fine target if you land on him. Uh, this stuff will play. Good four-seamer, really good slider, change mix. Uh, didn't throw the curveball a lot, but we'll just have to see how this kind of evolves uh, if he can throw strikes early in the count. And that's really going to be the only issue with him. And this is still at Yankee Stadium, so don't be surprised if um, he he gives up a little bit of contact and, and gives up some power. Because as we mentioned, we got Rizzo, Glaber, and DJ right there in the middle of the lineup. That can make it a little difficult on him. They are veteran patient hitters that aren't going to whiff and beat themselves. So they will take walks and they will get on base. And some of these younger hitters down at the bottom of the lineup, uh, like an Ozzy Cabrera uh, or an Ozzy Peraza, perhaps if he's in the lineup today, um, they they have some upside and you know they can they can attack and, and hit with guys in scoring position. Uh, runners in scoring position, and they can get to a young arm here if he starts to get wild a little bit. So some variance, definitely, but I think he's a fine target. Definitely both guys on the mound would be the preference here. Uh, I'm not super interested in playing the Yankees, um, but they're at playable price tags for those three guys in the middle. If you want to add in a Volpe up at the top and a cheap piece, Ozzy Cabrera or a Willie Calhoun, if you need to get down there or something, I think that's fine, but probably uh, pretty off the board and don't think you're going to need it, mostly pitching in this game for me. Okay, let's move on. Chicago and the Nats. Um, Aiden Wisniewski on the mound. I like this price tag for Wes. 5,300 here, and he's going to pop a little bit in the value score as well. Median projection so far, pushing 12 points. We're going to say this a lot, just kind of in the mid-range. I think he's a, he's a fine option. Price adjusted. Now, the, the difficulty we're going to run into here with Wes, uh, it's not really the arsenal necessarily. He's throwing the sinker a bit too much here, but at neutral value so far, that's really all you can hope for with a with a sinker. It's not a 
an excellent strikeout pitch necessarily. Uh, it's more of a ground ball pitch. Um, but he's staying a bit more up in the strike zone, relying more heavily on the four-seamer slider. That'll give him a little bit more of a neutral and, and fly ball lean in the in the ratios. So uh, Cutter is going to be the soft contact pitch for him. Hasn't really shown up quite just yet in terms of inducing a lot of soft contact, but he's going to be more of a more of a pitcher. This type of arsenal, a lot of fastballs. It's not necessarily going to be whiffs that we're targeting. Um, certainly, with the lack of a of an off speed pitch and a changeup, it's going to leave him a little bit more susceptible to opposite handed hitters, uh, but should be able to neutralize the right side pretty decently with a, a good slider here so far and, and cutter mix that should induce a good bit of soft contact as, as we grow into this sample. Still just 55 and a third on him and only 150 hitters, give or take, to the right side. So uh, good numbers with stuff leaving a little bit on the table with a sub 10% swinging strike rate. But uh, he's not going to walk people. The control has been great for West so far in the early going here in his, you know, 10 starts, give or take. Um, so it's all encouraging. Do we want to tack the Nats? That's really the issue. Early going here, sub 20% K rate, 73 WRC plus, very similar to Cleveland, 091 ISO, 091. 9% of the time they're hitting for extra bases here. Like this is incredibly low. So price adjusted, I think... I think West has six inning upside here for, yeah, sure, maybe he strikes out just five or something like that. But he can suppress here, and he's got enough in the arsenal to really keep Washington off balance. And, like, they've been really poor so far, um, hitting a lot of ground balls. So that really plays into, into West and the sinker-slider combination with the cutter inducing soft contact, and, and keeping the, the baseball down in the strike zone. So uh, I think price adjusted, this is a fine play down in this range. Uh, I'd r still rather get to the other couple of guys that we'll talk about later. But uh, if you land on some 5,300 and you can't make the other the other guys work, then I think this is a fine consideration price adjusted for Wes. On the other side, we have Trevor Williams, who's really actually been pretty good himself. Um, still major problems to the left side of the plate. He's been excellent against righties, huge K stuff against the right side, 30% nearly. It's an elite number. But it's the lefties where we uh, where we really want to target Trevor Williams. Um, 316 average allowed, 372 WOBA, both really big numbers, 197 ISO. Anything pushing 200 is, is pretty worrisome as well. Just a 9% strikeout rate still to the left side. Big sample here, 200 hitters, 47 innings. It's not necessarily hard contact, but it's it's barrel contact right on the middle to the left side of the plate, 1.7 homers per nine. So he gives it up quite a bit. Um, so that's how we want to attack. And from the Cubs, they've got some a, you know a lefty or two that they could throw in the lineup here. They're mostly right-handed heavy, but they have Ian Happ and Cody Bellinger both hitting from the left side who we we really like from the left side. Bellinger, now that he's had sort of a, a an early season resurgence, 4000 very playable price tag here. He's going to pop for you today um, in projection numbers. So doesn't mean that you can't play any righties, um, but I'd probably be staying off of Dansby. High strikeout rate against righties. Did finally get into a ball yesterday. It was good to see. Say a Suzuki is fine. Lowish strikeout rate against righties, but uh, we don't really want to be targeting Trevor Williams. So mostly just one-off pieces here, I think. Probably a half Cody Bellinger, maybe a, a short little two-man. Nico is up above 5,100 now, hitting from the right side. He's going to make a lot of contact, probably less likely, or certainly less likely to strike out. Um, but that price tag probably going to take you off most of your uh, most of your Nico Horner plays. Uh, and exposures today at second base. So um, favorite play would just be a Cody Bellinger and Ian Happ from the Cubs here. And if you want to run stacks, since Trevor Williams has really suppressed uh, against the left side so far this season, these are aggregate numbers going back to last year. Um, 
this isn't who he is. Changeup is really, really bad pitch, and eventually this is going to come to bite him because the secondary arsenal with the slider curveball change is not good. A lot of real negative value, and he's throwing a full 35% of these pitches here in aggregate. So he's going to have one of these days where he's not spotting the fastball, not getting any any drop on the two-seamer, and all the fastball is going to float. He's going to start walking people, and with the lack of a good arsenal, uh, that's going to snowball real fast. So down here at 5,200, he's one of these guys in this range that is projecting okay, but uh, arsenal-wise, I am not thrilled at all. I'd much rather play Wisniewski uh, on the other side. And because I think the Cubs are a far better lineup early going here, striking out just 22% clip, creating at a 110 WRC plus so far compared to the 73 for the Nats. 161 ISO hitting for uh, what a full 7% more power. 338 Woba getting on base a full 6 and 7% more. So give me the Cubs instead of Trevor Williams, even though the projection as opposed to Wisniewski, you know, it's half a point higher or whatever, same price tags. Um, give me Wes and the Cubs as opposed to the Nats. I'm, I'm pretty off of this list here today. On a full 12 gamer, it's going to be pretty rare that you are getting to any of the Nats, I think. Um, price adjusted, they're still very playable in that regard. Luis Garcia, not a lot of power from Cabert Ruiz behind the plate. But both of those guys, 25 and 2,900, respectively, playable price tags for sure. Joey Manessa still at 31, still playable. Dom Smith, 2,300. Guys like this, you could play Jamer at 3,000. If you get a really off-the-board stack, it's not horrible to be targeting some of these lefties due to the lack of a changeup for Wes. But overall, um, I think I would prefer Wes. Give me, uh, give me the Cubs. And then give me West and the Nats, then Trevor Williams, I think, um, in terms of playability. But overall, not super thrilled with getting to this game. Cubs, definitely an off-the-board stack if you want to get there. Okay, Minnesota and the White Sox. Joe Ryan on the mound for the Twins. 10-5, he's one of the aces we've talked about leading a rotation now. And he's been excellent to start the year. Starting to see the splitter numbers come into the sheet and converge here a little bit with the split change that he added. In the offseason, uh, the slider numbers coming down in terms of raw negative value. Um, this is the sweeper that he's also added. So starting to see a little bit of improvement in the secondary arsenal. Um, throwing mostly the splitter instead of the straight change anymore. But th the fastball has really always been the money pitch for Joe Ryan. Working off of the fastball, it's been his his best pitch uh, ever since he came up. So um, having added these two real plus pitches in the split change and the sweeper, making him a lot more viable uh, when we get into these price tags at 10-5 here on the mound. Now, given that Cole and Zach Gallon, who we'll get to, are both throwing today as well, it's going to keep his ownership down, and I think this is a fine tournament play. He still has plenty of upside to pop for 28 and 30 against an overall really weak lineup in, in the White Sox. We'll get to them in a sec. But at sub-10% ownership, I think this is very playable. There's nothing in the arsenal over here or suppression numbers or anything like that that are going to give us cause for um, concern and kind of make us balk a little bit, but... Um, now, he's a heavy fly ball pitcher with whiff stuff, and we generally don't like stacking against those types of guys. It's super hard to get there against them uh, unless you're very heavy in the line drive department. Now, there are only a couple of guys that are all that attractive from the White Sox in that regard, number one being Tim Anderson, 5,100 for him today at shortstop. They're getting him back. They, he will be activated, and this is it should help the lineup out pretty significantly. They've been dreadful ever since he went down, and getting him back should hopefully at least give them some sort of presence at the top where it's not just an automatic out anymore. Um, secondly, in the in the line drive department where we'd really like to go after Ryan, if we do, would be 
Benintendi. He's got a high line drive rate as well, but not a lot of raw power upside. He's got like an 080 ISO or something over his last 600 PAs. So not a lot of power from him. Uh, both of these guys, I mean, Benintendi, I think just tweaked, uh, tweaked a back or no, he got hit on the elbow um, over the weekend. So he should be back in the lineup having had uh, three days off or something like that. So it's really those two guys with lower strikeout rates that could make it a bit difficult on Joe Ryan. Um, everybody else in the list, of course, they've got low aggregate strikeout numbers, just 22, 23%. This is league average here, but just an 85 WRC plus so far. Um, we'll have to keep on a, keep an eye on Aloy Jimenez, who's been a little bit better recently, seeing the baseball a little bit better, walking a little bit more, striking out a little bit less. But he has been dealing with that leg problem um, for a couple of years now, and it looks like it's it's kind of nagging him a little bit recently. So those are really the only scary bats that we'd have to um, keep an eye on. Of course, Luis Robert will probably be back in there today, depending on how his hammy is feeling and if he is interested in, in running hard down the baseline or anything like that. Um, but that's, that's really it, and we're not overly scared about Andrew Benintendi anyway. So... Side with Joe Ryan for sure. At 10-5, uh, I think it's fine. And as I mentioned, he's sandwiched in between Zach Allen and Garrett Cole here. So I think you can get to him at some relatively low ownership. Um, it's going to be hard, though, given the projections of those two other guys. You might have to force in some Joe Ryan. If you're hand-building, I think this is a fine tournament play if you get to a chalkier stack. The White Sox have been dreadful for a while, and just because Tim Anderson is back doesn't mean that like the entire lineup is going to start hitting all of a sudden. It'll help, of course, um, but we can still target Joe Ryan here at, at a, a playable price tag. It, it's not my favorite, necessarily. I love playing Joe Ryan, uh, against, especially against teams uh, really with very little power, and the White Sox have shown that for pretty much the last you know year and a half or so. Um, so I like Joe, and we can get, we can get to him on the mound certainly. Michael Kopech on the other side, I don't think so. Um, uh, Kopech has been really struggling. The the K stuff isn't there. It really is there against the left side. He's pretty enigmatic, is Kopech, because he's right on the barrel, huge barrel rate here, eleven and a half percent, huge strikeout rate though to the left side. A lot of power that he that he gives up to lefties though as well with a one ninety six ISO. They don't hit for average. They strike out a lot, but he walks them. And when he does pitch contact to the lefties, it's right on, right on the barrel. No soft contact induced. Hard contact here at, at 33%. Anything north of 30 is something to note. Um, on the other side is really where he gets picked apart with more regularity, and that's due to the lack of raw whiff stuff and the lack of a good out pitch against right-handers. 162 ISO to righties, 15% K rate. 10% walk rate still, so elevated free passes here to both sides of the plate. Kopech throws hard, yeah, but like I don't care how hard you throw, you gotta like you gotta throw it over the plate. 57% strike one rate and a 12% um, emergent walk rate from that number is very concerning. It walks plus barrels and hard contact, that's a perfect recipe for full stacks. So if you want to get to some twin stacks today correlate with the Joe Ryan. I think that's a fine play. Um, price tags are elevating a little bit on the twins now. They do have Georgie Blanco, who's back in and solidifying the middle of the lineup, hitting from both sides there. He's at 47. That's playable. Second base, probably an expensive tag in general, but uh, one of the better hitting second basemen you're going you're gonna to find in baseball. Uh, Carlos Correo at, at 4,700. He's playable as well. Buxton, 54, seems to be finding the barrel a little bit more as, as weather is warming up. Um, and Kepler at the top, 37. That's, that's a playable price for him. Trevor Larnick down here at 34. I think this is a generally a, a pitch mix playable spot for him because Kopech is relying mostly on the four-seamer here, full 60% of the arsenal with without a changeup. And Trevor Larnick at 3,400 his main problem is the swing and miss against the off-speed stuff and the breaking stuff. And that's really not all that plus for Kopech. So, um, however, Larnick will still strike out, and 
the 29% K rate against lefties is really nothing to sneeze at here. So um, I wouldn't go out of my way to target Alarnik, but I wouldn't leave him off of stacks if I got to any of the twins here today. Um, this barrel rate and these walks here are very concerning for Kopech. And as we've mentioned a couple of times in the past, um, or the past week or so, that there's something going on over here in Chicago. Their starting pitching has been terrible top to bottom for, uh, you know, going on three weeks now. So, uh, like the Twins, naturally seeing uh, an elevated run total on them. It is chilly in Chicago tonight, just 50 degrees, so you got to keep an eye on that. But I think you can get to full Twins here, and in early going, uh, or early ownership runs, um, really not seeing a whole hell of a lot on them. Buxton really always gets played. Um, but everybody else kind of off the board here. So I think you get to some twins, really not excited about playing any of the White Sox. I'd rather not go after Joe Ryan. Okay, uh, next we have Toronto and the Sox. Um, disappointing day yesterday from Toronto, outside of maybe a Bo Bichette or something. Five for five, I believe, for him with a bomb. Um, less disappointing for the Red Sox. They got there a little bit. Yusei Kikuchi on the mound for the Jays. 8300 This is an intriguing price tag. I think this is an okay price for him, given that I, th I think he has fixed the some of the issues a little bit more readily than has somebody like a Josie Barrios from yesterday. Uh, we saw that he gave it up to lefties pretty good still, um, and it's going to take a couple more starts to see from these, you know, these couple of guys that have had serious issues, Kikuchi and Jose Barrios, um, for us to get convinced that they've really solved the issues. And even though Kikuchi has been a little bit better, um, it's going to take a lot to bring these numbers down against right-handers. 251 average, not so bad there, but a 370 Woba, 254 ISO, and a 12% walk rate to the right side of the plate with a 42.5% Pitch info, hard contact rate. I mean, it's just out of control, terrible. 13.5% barrel rate for Kikuchi. Um, with walks as well, 56% strike one rate. So it's going to take more than just a couple of good starts for Kikuchi against, overall, a, a couple of weak teams. Um, in his first couple of starts this year, he has seen uh, the White Sox, who we just talked about, the Angels, Kansas City. All of these guys, it, even the Yankees, have been pretty underwhelming so far. So the only real good team that he has seen so far has been Tampa, and he actually tore them apart. So um, still some variance here with Kikuchi. At, at 8,300, the projection is going to make it very difficult for you to get to him because it's an elevated price, and there's guys at far lower prices with higher projections. So it's going to be nearly impossible to get to Kikuchi outside of uh, forcing in particular lineup builds So um, and constructions. So it's going to be a little difficult to get there. And against Boston, it's not really all that great a matchup. They are a little bit better against right-handers since they can platoon so heavily than they are against lefties. 23% K rate against lefties this year. Still walking, though, and patient. 148 ISO, so pretty underwhelming and below average there. 324 Woba, about average there. 102 WRC Plus, certainly average there. So um, not overly attractive to be targeting some Boston pieces here, but it's the price tag and the lower median projection that's probably going to keep me off of Kikuchi today. Uh, I just think there's plenty of other guys that I that we'd rather get to, and I'm still worried that even against a... Um, a pretty underwhelming right-handed platoon here with, in terms of power, uh, Justin Turner, Rob Ref Snyder, Kike Hernandez, Christian Arroyo, Connor Wong behind the plate. Um, yeah, I'm still worried about these issues, and I need to see these numbers come down in aggregate over large samples uh, before I start getting super excited about targeting Kikuchi at an elevated price on a full slate against an okay lineup over here uh, and guys that are going to be kind of pesky. Justin Turner's not going to strike out. Ref Snyder still has good numbers against lefties, even though he's been terrible to start the season. Uh, Rafi Devers hits lefties just fine. Verdugo doesn't strike out really at all either. Uh, Kike historically has hit lefties great. So not my favorite to be going after Kikuchi here. Would much rather play some Boston, but I don't want to do that either. 
Uh, Tanner Hawk on the mound for the Sox, 8100 not thrilled with this price tag. We'd rather get him at the 5400 We saw him a couple of starts ago, um, or maybe maybe in his last start. Uh, in any case, uh, he's 81, and we don't want to be doing this. So, uh, yeah, he was 5400 two starts ago and to get two starts ago against the Twins, and he went seven innings, struck out seven in that start, gave up three, but he was still pretty good, got a win out of it. So, um, elevated price tag here for for Tanner Hawk. Sinker, slider, cutter combo mostly. Throwing a bit of a split change, it's fine. We'll talk about some other guys that have the really good split change. Well, notably like a, a Joe Ryan who we've already talked about, but um, his splitter here for Hawk is a little bit below league average in terms of value. But it's a fine whiff pitch for him. It's it's not a, a wipeout split, uh, but it's enough of a of an off balance pitch that it can neutralize a, a little bit of the power that he would otherwise give up without it. So uh, it's fine. But if a fine fastball mix here, good value out of the sinker and the cutter so far. But a lot of this arsenal, uh, a lot of these numbers have are are kind of swayed because he came out of the bullpen a lot. So. Um, now that he's fully stretched, he is fully stretched. He's gone, I mean, what is this, three starts in a row now with 85 or more pitches. And in his first two starts, 70 and 74. So um, that's not a concern. He is in the rotation. He's fully stretched. But he gets Toronto on the other side. This team's not going to strike out as it is. And his strikeout stuff in general, uh, in aggregate, I suppose, is about 22%. A little better to the right side of the plate, but just about league average. He's got the really good slider sinker cutter combo as i mentioned that neutralizes a lot of the production to the right side but again a little bit noisy here because most of these innings against righties were setup innings coming out of the bullpen so we'll have to see how this fleshes out a bit more really encourage with such high ground ball numbers and okay strikeout stuff for hawk um but still a little bit of susceptibility to getting on the barrel uh to the left side of the plate 34.5% hard contact with a 167 ISO. 125 or 13% walk rate nearly to lefty. So if the susceptibility is going to creep up, it's probably going to be there. Um, but they do still have some pretty damn good right-handed hitters over here in Toronto as well. Uh, expensive still. Springer, well, he's probably not going to be in the, in the lineup it, since he got scratched uh, with an illness yesterday. Bo Bichette at 58. He's been great to start the year. Uh, I'm still not thrilled about paying 58 for Bichette, but perhaps coming into his own here in his, what, third, fourth season or something. Vladdy, hopefully starting to see him heat up a little. 6000 for him. Matt Chapman still at 55 so very expensive stack to get to. Uh, it's going to keep them completely off the board. If you want to go after Tanner Hawk here, there's a little bit of variance, but I really don't like targeting high ground ball pitchers like this um, with pretty neutral ground ball to fly ball guys uh, I'd rather them have a little bit more of a fly ball lean and in general um, a lot of their better hitters over here particularly like a Vladdy it's kind of a, a line drive and and ground ball hitters themselves um, Matt Chapman fine 55 in terms of a raw batted ball profile fly ball hitter uh, Danny Jansen if he's in the list fly ball hitter so you can get there with a Springer Pichette Vladdy Chapman, Danny Jansen. If you want to throw in a Dalton Varsho, I think that's fine too. Would probably have to stay off of Brandon Bell. He's just been dreadful. Kevin Kiermaier make it make it cheap for you at the bottom of the lineup, so that's fine. Not overly crazy about playing some Toronto here, but an elevated run total pretty much every day that we're going to see with Toronto is here with us again uh, at north of five. So um, they're fine if you want to go after them, and they have upside to really pick apart anybody if if we're walking people and Tanner Hawk here I don't know bullpen arm or not 53% strike one rate is a big problem so elevated price tag for him and some susceptibility and being able to throw strikes against a pretty damn good lineup no thank you give me mostly just offense here I'm not super interested in the pitching but I'm not crazy about offense either um just kind of a meh game all right Baltimore and Kansas City um Tyler Wells here on the mound for the Orioles, 7,300. I think this is an interesting price tag for him. I think you can play him here. This is a decent spot. And we'll get to the Royals in a second. This is an interesting spot for them as well. Really, really elite changeup for Tyler Wells. Um, it helps neutralize a lot of the power that he would otherwise give up. 
because he doesn't have raw whiff stuff in terms of pure velocity or anything like that. 23% K rate, though, it's about league average. It's a pretty damn good number. Elite soft contact number, 23% to the left side. So no power in, in the platoon uh, coming against Tyler Wells. It's really the righties that he has trouble with. It's because the slider is about average. Curveball is you know, below average. doesn't use this a lot. Um, we'll throw the, the righty-righty change a little bit, but stays on the barrel a little bit more to the right side of the play and just doesn't have the raw whiff pitch with the slider. Just sub-16% strikeout rate to righties here, 31.5% hard contact, 1.5 homers per 9. Big fly ball number, 065 ground ball to fly ball to the righties. So I would rather go after Tyler Wells if I'm going to with right-handers. Um... And that's Bobby Witt, and that's Salvi Perez territory. You can get to an Eddie Olivares as well. I think that's fine. Neither, None of those guys really strike out uh, against, well, super low strikeout pitchers, of course. Salvi's problem really is, is strikeouts, but um, it's mostly in the chase rate for Salvi. But uh, we're now getting Salvi at 4,300, and we're, we're not paying 5K for him anymore. And now this isn't this is in a playable range where we can get to some Salvador Perez. Bobby Witt's still at 5,000. He's playable. Vinny hits both sides great. 3,700, he'll be probably in the two or the three. Uh, you could play him as well. MJ Melendez, not super crazy about this because of the high strikeout rate and a little bit of susceptibility to getting picked apart by this good changeup over here from Tyler Wells. Uh, but you can throw him in, into a stack if you need to add in a fifth like uh, like a Kyle Isbell or a Nick Prado or Michael Massey, something like that. Again, not crazy about playing those guys from the left side of the plate because of this changeup. Um, so I prefer probably a three or a four man here if you get to the Royals. I think it's an interesting spot because the strikeout rate is so low to the right side of the plate. Getting to a Bobby Witt, Salvi Perez, Eddie Olivares, adding in a Vinny Pascantino who doesn't strike out at all anyway. Um, I think it's a, a nice little four-man that you can get to really off the board. Don't get me wrong. The Royals are terrible. In aggregate this season, they're just as bad as the Nats here. 108 ISO with a 262 Woba and a 26% K rate. 61 WRC plus against righties. 775 PAs. Yeah, this is a bad baseball team over here. So I think you can play that short stack just because Tyler Wells is attackable with righties. But I'd probably side with Tyler Wells in most instances here. 7,300, I like this price tag. He's one of the guys in this range I think we can get to. Uh, it's a pretty damn good matchup for him. And despite the low upside in general for Wells and this being a 12-game slate, uh, I mean, I wouldn't go out of my way to, to play him on the mound. But if you land on a 7,300, I, I certainly wouldn't balk at this um, if you like your team otherwise. it I think it's perfectly fine. It's a really good matchup. But like I said, we can get to the Royals on the other side. We're not going to get to any Ryan Yarbrough, though. 5000 for him, uh, that's fine. At least he's not at 9000 anymore or, or whatever he was every day when coming in as a long reliever for the Rays. But he just doesn't have any strikeout stuff himself. 16% in aggregate. He's better to lefties. More traditional pl platoon split for him. So we want to go after him with righties. And good thing for Baltimore, they got a lot of those guys. They're... Popping here in the in the run total as well. They're going to be off the board. Probably going to see sub-8% on every single one of these guys today. So if you want to get to one of the warmer weather games here in Kansas City, about 65 degrees or so, Ballpark plays up power a little bit when it's a little a little warmer. I mean, Don't get me wrong, pitcher's ball, ballpark still. But uh, we can go after some Ryan Yarbrough with some righties here. Austin Hayes, Rutch, Mountcastle, Santander, Ramon Urias, um, Georgie Mateo, of course, has been fantastic to start the year as well. Elevated price tags for some of these guys, of course. But you can make this work if they throw in, like, a Ryan McKenna or something and, and do a, their leadoff shenanigans with him. He's 2,000. So you you can make this Baltimore stack work if you want to go after Yarbrough. I think that's perfectly fine. The Royals have a bad bullpen also. Uh, so if you want to go after the full Baltimore stacks correlated with Tyler Wells. I think that's a fine tournament play. It's going to be pretty off the board. Very low ownership on Wells so far. Like I said, if you land on him, I think this is fine. Um, really not intrigued with anything outside of that uh, that short Royal stack, but I, I do think it's a viable tournament play. 
Okay, Angels and the Cards. Patty Sandoval on the mound for the Halos and Steven Mass for the Cards. Uh, 71 for Patty Sandoval. I, I, I can't do this. Um, the, the strikeout stuff just hasn't been there this season. Now I, I love Patty and I'm, I'm really waiting for the changeup to turn into a, a big whiff pitch for him, but the four seamer has not been good over his last 175 innings. And it's just, it's not improving all that much this season in terms of raw strikeout. So it makes him difficult to play in DFS. But he's another one of these guys in this range that you, if you land on, I think it, it's all right. This is a terrible matchup for him, though. In the early going, the Cardinals have been pretty disappointing against lefties. 23% K rate is shockingly high. 185 ISO, though, still hitting for power. 8.5% walk rate's average. 356 Woba, hitting for a lot of average. 288 average as, as a team. That's a big, big number. 124 WRC plus because that average is so high, despite the elevated K rate, 42% hard contact against lefties is an outrageously high number. So I'm not going near Patty here today, even though the K rate is a little bit higher for, for against lefties for the cards in general. Um, it, it, Patty's not going to strike anybody out at a terribly high clip. Average to both sides of the plate, 23%. And it's not production that is really going to bite Patty. It's pitching to a little bit too much contact and getting into trouble and elevating his pitch count. Um, it, it's difficult for Patty to get out of those kinds of holes that he puts himself in early in the count because he elevates his pitch count and starts walking people a little bit and putting people on base for free. So hard for him to really develop into the slider and the curveball plus pitches for him when he's having trouble spotting the four-seamer and throwing the change of first strike and getting whiffs on it. So, uh, fine sinker here, but I don't want to be, like, targeting a left-handed sinker against Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado. Like, absolutely not. No, thank you. So, give me some other cards here. Uh, I think laying thirty on them is okay. However, the Halos get Steven Matz on the, on the mound on the other side, and he's been dreadful. 5,900 for him. I'm not touching this. I don't care if the projection is high. Uh, he has been awful. And these the problems to both sides of the plate are really starting to creep up here in the early going this season. Some of the K stuff has been there, sure. But do we really want to be targeting a an 18.5% K rate over 300 PAs for, uh, against the Angels here? I, I, I don't. Uh, 163 ISO. They've been markedly better against lefties than versus righties this year as we see the WRC plus in aggregate in about 700 PAs against righties uh, is far, far lower. Drops, drags this WRC plus all the way down to a 108 versus the 126 that they're exhibiting against lefties right now. So uh, 163 ISO power showing up a little bit and kind of sneaky 18.5% K rates an elite number as a team aggregate, and I'm not going near Steven Matz here. They've got a, a lot of righties here. They could fully platoon outside of Shohei Otani, and it's Shohei Otani. I don't, I don't really care. Uh, he'll strike out against some lefties, but uh, it's still Shohei and all the power in the world. Zach Neto at the top of the lineup. He, he'll make it cheap for you, 2,700. I think that's fine. Trout and Renfro, you got to pay for at 63 and 49. But you can get to Rendon. He's still at 42. You can get to Brandon Drury, who's been excellent. 41 that's playable Taylor Ward they've, they've dropped him down a little bit because he's struggling to start the season but 4300 kind of hard to play that in the seven hole outside of stacks but you can get to that in in a stack here Chad Wallach behind the plate's got some pop not my favorite $3,500 catcher play um certainly but you can play some of the halos here as well so despite the dollar 30 that you got to lay in the cards against Patty Sandoval I think plus 10 you know plus a dime uh, on the Halos could be an intriguing play as well if you want to go after some Steven Matz. And I, I really kind of do. I don't believe in this stuff at all. Uh, I don't really care about the strikeout rate. If you give up this much power, 191 ISO and a 33% hard contact rate with a 1.7 homers per nine, Trout, Rendon, Renfro, Drury, Taylor Ward, I, like, no, I'm not dealing with this uh, with Steven Matz. So I'm fully off of this. I don't care about the projection. <laughs> I, I like. I know what it says, but um, this is it. This this arsenal is bad. He he throws a sinker 50% of the time, and that's a horrible, horrible pitch when you have uh, 
problems to the opposite side of the plate. So, um, no, no, thank you. Give me offense pretty much only in this game, even though I, I like Patty in general, but uh, give me Tyler Wells instead of him at $200 more expensive. Okay, Arizona and Texas. Um, Zach Allen on the mound, 10000 for him, 31% ownership. Sheesh. But he's he's every bit an ace, and north of 20 in the early projection here, I, I think this is fine. This is a perfectly attackable lineup against Texas. I generally don't like going after them. They're a good list over here, but Zach Gallon's arsenal is fantastic. Um, the, the the strikeout stuff is there. The early, early strike one rate is, is very strong. He doesn't walk people. He puts himself in equitable counts to get to the change up, the curveball, and the slider. Plus, plus pitches for him. Good value on the cutter here as well. And the four-seamer is just fantastic. I mean... Everything about Zach Gallen here is is elite, and there's really I did, like I don't want to go after him. Uh, the only guy that I would really consider, I, I, I suppose, two here would be a Marcus Semien. He's a really good fastball hitter, but Zach Gallen has plenty in the in the secondary arsenal to neutralize him. So no, thank you, uh, especially at 5700. But he, he's certainly the best hitter on the on the team. Uh, Nate Lowe at 4400, he'd be the other guy I'd like to go after, but um, in terms of a raw platoon, like Zach Allen gives up an 094 ISO with a 145 average allowed, 31% K rate to the left side, no hard contact to, to either side of the plate. And if anything, it would be a slightly elevated line drive rate to the righties. So Adelise Garcia at 5,500. No, he strikes out a boatload. So give me some Zach Allen here for sure. Market kind of agrees. Um, We'll have to see what the ownership does throughout the day here at a full 31%. But this is a playable price tag. If you can't get all the way up to Garrett Cole, I think this is a very viable option. Um, but we also talked about Joe Ryan at 10-5. He's a viable option as well. So the ownership here to Gallon, I think it's it's perfectly warranted in terms of a batted ball and, and strikeout matchup. Now, the Rangers here at 22.5%, that's, you know, it's, it's about average, 120 WRC plus, big number, hitting for a lot of power so far, getting on base. So they could make it a little bit difficult on, on Zach Gallen. Um, and it's notable that we've only had to pay north of 10000 for Gallen about four times in the last four seasons. So when he gets up in this, in this price range, we have historically seen a bit more variance start to creep up with, with Gallen. But um, I think this is a different arm now. He's really developed all five pitches here ever since uh, Matt Strom came down to Arizona. So um, I, I love Gallon. He's every bit an ace, and I have no problem playing him against pretty much every lineup in baseball. I don't really care. Um, John Gray on the mound for the Rangers, 8700 Eh, not super thrilled about this price tag uh, on this particular slate, again, median projection here so far. It's going to keep his ownership down, definitely. Uh, but historically, he's always had he's had problems with the left side of the plate. He's had a good slider and a fine four-seamer. Um, okay changeup. But when he starts struggling with the four-seamer command and, and starts spraying it a little bit, that's kind of when he gets in trouble. And it's really against the left side of the plate. Now, he's got a pretty big history the Diamondbacks know him very well they know his arsenal due to his history at Coors Field playing for the Rockies and they've got some hitters over here that have seen him well in the past 20% aggregate K rate for them so far this year neutral at a, at a dead even 100 WRC plus so far um, they're probably going to be missing Corbin Carroll we'll have to keep an eye on that he banged his knee into a wall or whatever it should be fine but they still have plenty of other guys from the left side of the plate that can make it a little bit difficult on John Gray at a slightly fishy price tag here. Not that he doesn't have upside at 8700 to pop for 25 or something, but I think we'd probably rather get to some other guys uh, a little bit cheaper with notably higher projections and similarly uh, very low ownership. So uh, I like the batted ball profile for the Diamondbacks here against righties, even though it's just 100 WRC plus so far this year, they're still going to get on base and still going to run. And this is a cheaper stack. If you need to get to some expensive arms on the mound, uh, 
Arizona can make that happen for you. You play Josh Rojas. He's 54. It's not great, but it's not 57, 59 that we were paying for him recently. Uh, Cattell Marte back above 5,000 where he should be. 52 for him. That's fine. Paven Smith, 34. Big fly ball hitter. This is a, an upside spot for him. Uh, you can get to that as well. And some of the, the cheaper guys down at the bottom of the lineup. Lourdes is 42. He, it's right. He's fine. Uh, Alec Thomas, 2,400. That's a, a good piece in the middle of the lineup he'll likely be moved up in the absence of Corbin Carroll so uh give me the Diamondbacks but I'm not overly thrilled about offense in this game just in general I respect John Gray and the Arsenal and when he's rolling he can pick through a lot of lineups as well when he's spiking this slider and and really burying this change up spotting the four seamer and and throwing strikes early in the count. When he starts to spray it, it's because he, he doesn't have the fastball command and all of a sudden John Gray's given up two or three innings or two or three runs in the first inning and you're really behind the eight ball. So um not my favorite to go after him at, at eighty seven hundred today. Would prefer mostly the D backs and, and Zach Gallen. Okay. San Francisco and the Astros. Anthony DiSclefani not dealing with this uh, at 7,900 against Houston. He's given up too much power to both sides over his last 49 innings this year uh, and last year, I suppose. Um, still a bit of a noisy sample since he was hurt a lot of last season, but way too much hard contact. I mean, it, I, we can't deal with this. He's always had problems to the left side with a bad four-seamer. He's thrown mostly the sinker and a bad changeup to the left side of the plate. That's, he's always had very serious issues with whiff stuff and with power to the left side of the plate, but now it's starting to creep up against righties too. 206 ISO, just an average 23% K rate here and 37% hard contact, one and a half homers per nine to right-handers. 304 average to righties, 295 average to lefties. Way too much contact here for for DiSclefani. Uh No thank you at 7,900. Give me the Strohs, definitely. Uh, on the mound for them is Hunter Brown. He was fantastic. I believe in his last start, it was against Tampa. And this is really what we have been waiting for for Hunter Brown, um, to really pick apart a very good lineup. And he struck out 11 in seven full innings, gave up just two hits uh, against the Rays. He was fantastic. Really nothing to worry about. Uh, this, the arsenal here is excellent here in the early going. Four-seamer slider curveball change is a work in progress, but as soon as he develops this pitch, it's going to make him totally deadly, and he will be the eight. I'm not that he isn't already, almost. Um, I guess kind of by default with everybody in Houston's starting rotation getting hurt. But everything in the early going here for Hunter Brown, uh, velocity-wise, huge ground ball rate, very encouraging. It's not, and he's not sacrificing with and K stuff with. With ground balls, I mean, and, and not replacing all of that with ground balls, I, I guess I should say. Uh, he's staying off the barrel. He's not walking people. He's throwing strikes. And this is the upside that Hunter Brown offers. He's, he's for several years now, been uh, probably the top pitching prospect in baseball. So uh, really starting to see this come to fruition here a little bit. Uh, if there is some, some susceptibility in the early going here in his first 100 hitters against lefties, it has been with some walks and that's mostly due to the lack of a, a really plus plus change. Um, tries to throw the curveball a little bit too much to lefties, I think, but yeah, and this is fine with just three pitches to start here in his young career, he'll develop a little bit more of this arsenal uh, and it, it should be fine. So hard contact is not a worry. It, despite a higher walk rate to the lefty, he still has a two Oh ground ball to fly ball and a 20% soft contact rate there. Um, hasn't given up a single homer yet, so that's uh, pretty notable in in 50 innings so far. But uh, so could one of these guys from the Giants pop in for one? Well, yeah, this is kind of what they do. Uh, we saw Jock hit a just an absolute rocket moonshot yesterday. 227 ISO, 26% K rate, high walk rate, nine and a half percent for for the Giants over here. Uh, three true outcomes, and they have lost one of their, I guess, higher fly ball rate hitters in, in Yastrzemski. He's on the DL now um, with a hamstring or something. But we can still, like, he strikes out a lot, but we can still target 
all of these giants over here because every single one of them is, is still going to whiff uh, outside of like a Wilmer Flores or, or something like that. Um, so we can go after all of these guys with Hunter Brown. It's going to keep his ownership a little bit depressed that we've got the other guys a little bit more expensive than him, but we're still seeing 17% on him. So market very bullish on Hunter Brown here today against the Giants, and, and I kind of am as well. Uh, I'm not super crazy about the price tag, but I've been playing him north of, of this in, in very bad matchups for uh, his last couple of starts against Atlanta and Tampa. So um, not like I'm really going to stop now against a team that strikes out a hell of a lot more than both of those other teams. So uh, give me Hunter Brown and definitely give me the Astros. You can play everybody from them. Uh, Di Sclafani, I think the Astros is going to be kind of an off-the-board stack for us here today. Uh, Di Sclafani giving up too much power to the right side, seeing very low ownership, even on Jordan Alvarez, who normally pops north of 10% on every slate. You're only seeing about 8 or 9 on him right now. So um, give me all of the Strohs and very little of the Giants. If you want to target a, a home run hitter from the Giants, uh Sure, but it's probably only going to be Jock Peterson or maybe like a Lamont Wade. But uh, I'm not super thrilled about either of those spots either. Okay, let's get to Milwaukee and the Rockies at Coors Field. Freddie Peralta on the mound. Really good price tag here for Freddie. And I think this is another one of these guys at Coors Field that you can play. The Rockies are bad, man. And they only exploded over the weekend because Ryan Nelson has an 18% strikeout rate. Or whatever. He's just not going to throw it past them. But when the Rockies get a guy that has velocity and has K stuff, they really, really struggle. It, even Merrill Kelly they struggled against, and he's only got about a 22% K rate or whatever it is. 27% aggregate K rate for Freddie. The only problem with Freddie has always been the walks. It's throwing strikes. It's not the velo. It's not the stuff. It's throwing it over the plate, and that's the problem that he can get into here. He does throw a curveball full 50% of the time, so we want to be aware of that. Not likely to break nearly as hard at uh, at Coors Field, but this is an attractive price tag, and we've been paying north of 10000 for Freddie in pretty much every start this year. So he's back down at, uh, at 8800 He was 87 I believe, in his first start of the season. So we're buying seasonal price lows on Freddie in a pretty damn good spot, strikeout-wise, uh, against the Rockies, even though this is at Coors Field and 65 degrees or whatever. Uh, it's fine to go after this this lineup because he doesn't really have a susceptibility in terms of contact or, or production allowed to either side of the plate. He induces nearly 20% soft contact to both sides. Really, really good arsenal here from Freddie. Again, it, it's only throwing strikes. Now, the Rockies do have some lefties that could make it a little difficult on him at the top of the lineup, no, notably a uh, Charlie Blackman or a Jury Profar, Ryan McMahon, sure. Um, but in terms of raw production, those guys have left quite a bit on the table to start the season so far. And in aggregate, 23% K rate, 76 WRC plus with a 135 ISO. No hard contact, a lot of soft contact, ground ball to fly ball at a buck ten or so. Hitting some baseballs on a line. So if we are going after Freddie, it would be with some righties, as a matter of fact, because he's got a 24% line drive rate to the right side. So if you want to get to a Chris Bryant at 5,700 against Freddie Peralta, uh, I'm not super crazy about that on a full 12 gamer. CJ Crone, also not wild about this, 4,900. So some of these righty uh, right-handers from the Rockies are, are not in the best... Um, not at the best prices to be targeting a very high upside strikeout arm in Freddie Peralta. So I'd rather get to him at 8,800. Nobody's going to play him because he's also at an elevated price tag, but he's one of the few guys on the day that can pop for 30, and he could strike out 10 here in six innings and, and piece through the Rockies pretty good. Undoubtedly a lower median projection, so you'd have to force this in, but this is going to keep his ownership down. If you need to get to this, or if you land on it, I think this is a perfectly fine play. Uh, I'm not all that encouraged uh, or enthused about playing any of the Rockies here at these price tags. Um, Charlie Blackman's fine, 46. Jury Profar is at, at 37. Sure, he's in the two-hole at Coors Field, like whatever, uh, against a guy that throws a curveball. Sure, but um, you want to throw in a couple of the righties? Yeah, but like not my favorite price adjusted plays on a full slate. 5,600 for Ryan Feltner. Ugh, man, his last two starts have been great in... His last start against Cleveland was excellent in a really difficult spot. The K stuff started to show up. That's because he's 
he's getting a lot of value out of the four seamer and the changeup combination here. Four seamers historically been bad, and he's had trouble spotting it, throwing it for strikes. But the changeup's been really good over the last couple of starts. Slider's always been pretty good. He needs to stop throwing the curveball. Uh, certainly, a Coors Field needs to stop throwing this pitch. Um, but needs to work on spotting and and getting a little bit more value out of the fastball combination here in the four seamer, two seamer. Changeup, he can work off of that if he can throw the four seamer in the in the sinker for a strike. So. Um, it, it's been walks that have really gotten him in trouble, and you can't do that at Coors Field. 5,600, there's other guys in this range. We'd much rather get to a Mason Miller or even a Bryce Miller down a little bit cheaper than Ryan Feltner. I need to see more than two starts of, you know, of plus uh, performance from him before I start getting jacked about playing a playing him at Coors Field on a on a full slate. So if you want to play the Brewers, yeah, go ahead. They've been striking out, sure. Wouldn't be surprised if Feltner suppresses here for five or five innings or so strikes out another five uh, a little bit more patient though so they'll make it difficult on him make him throw strikes and this is a obviously playing at Coors Field a very high upside spot for the Brewers you're gonna have to pay for him for Yelich 55 Willie Adamas 59 Rowdy up to 48 now um, unfortunate there but everybody else pretty playable Jesse Winker gonna be one of the more popular plays of the day at 3600 likely in the two hole uh, Willie Contreras behind the plate, 46, very popular there as well. So um, give me the Brewers for sure, pretty much off of the Rockies, but I think you can play some Freddie Peralta if you play some very chalky t uh, players with him. Okay, Cincy and the Padres. Uh, Graham Ashcraft on the mound. I don't know what we're doing with this $9,400 price tag. Uh, no thank you. It, it's We just can't do this. Uh, it has a 16% aggregate K rate. Um, it, it's not really in in the opposite side of the platoon against lefties like the suppression numbers are elite against the left side and he throws gas he throws very hard but it's the right side that he really gets in trouble like 324 average 385 woba with a 183 iso to the right side 14 percent strikeout rate to right it's not because like, the woba's not so high because he's walking people it's because they're hitting for average here 170 ground ball to fly ball, so they're they're getting it on a line here at a full 20%, really to both sides. 38% hard contact rate to the righties, and I'm not dealing with that, certainly at this price tag. No thank you. Give me the Padres almost definitely, uh, and that's Tatis, Machado, Bogarts, Territory, Juan Soto starting to heat up. Uh, you can play him against everybody now, um, now that he's making contact. So give me the pods for sure. Michael Walk on the mound for them. 7,500? Yeah. It's kind of a gross spot here because Waka gives up power himself and a good bit of average to righties as well. 274 here with a 199 ISO and a 337 Woba. 32-33% hard contact rate to the right side. Very little soft contact, sub-16%. So you can go after Waka with same-handed hitters. You can go after him with lefties as well. 187 ISO. Strikeout rate a little bit higher there. That's because of the really good change that he's always had. 24%, but an 075 ground ball to fly ball there induces more soft contact, so it's a little more difficult to get there with lefties, but if you want to add some lefties into the stack, that's fine. TJ Friedel and Jake Fraley are the lefties from the Reds that you would consider. Uh, they're at playable price tags now, finally. Fraley not up at 5K anymore. Um, Johnny India and Tyler Stevenson, however, still at kind of unplayable price tags. 4,800 is really tough to get to for a second baseman uh, that doesn't exhibit a whole hell of a lot of power. That's not like, you know, a Jose Altuve or something like that. Um, and Stevenson behind the plate at 45, power still ha hasn't quite shown up yet. So Steer is at 3,200. He'll probably be in the three or maybe the five hole or something like that. Uh, and they have some cheaper pieces if you want to go after a walk. This is a super off the board stack, but... Um, I think I'd prefer getting to walk. He's going to be the probably the most popular guy in this mid-range just because he gets the Reds. And the Reds are striking out at a 25% clip so far this year, 113 ISO, 83 WRC+. Plus. This is like White Sox territory. So they've been pretty bad as well. 10% walk rate, that's not White Sox territory. That's like Brewers territory. So um, a little bit different identity here for the Reds. They could make this difficult on Waka because he, he gives up power a little bit. And in the early runs, we were seeing him at about 15, 18%. I thought that was way too high. Now we're getting back down to the 10% range where I think it's more playable. Um, 
if you land on a 7,500, it's fine. I think he has upside for 22, 25 points here if he can run deep into a game. But I'm probably going to end up filtered toward more expensive arms and, and cheaper arms rather than landing on a Michael Walk. I'd almost rather play a Tyler Wells, I think. But uh, at 7,300, but I think Waka is, is fine, and he's certainly going to project the highest for you out of anybody in this mid-range. Okay, Seattle and Oakland. Um, this is the this is the game of the night, I suppose. Uh, Bryce Miller on the mound. He's making his debut for the Mariners. Uh, don't have any data here in the in the sheet. He has only made appearances at Double A. That's the highest regular season action that he's received in the minors. Uh, but he has experience against big league lineups. He's gotten plenty of work in spring training, and they just wanted to keep him down and, and tune him up a little bit before bringing him up sometime this season. And Chris Flexen has really served as kind of a, a paperweight um, in the rotation here. So they're, they're bumping him to the bullpen, and they got to start making some decisions. So here's Bryce Miller. The stuff will play. He's got plus four pitches, a uh, lot of velo. And kid throws hard, really good four seamer, really good slider. Also has the curveball change that he mixes in. As with any young arm, the only problem that we're going to run into is command, and that's being able to throw strikes early in the count. Now, if you go look at his numbers early in the season, everything is going to tell you to stack Oakland against him. Um, I think that would be a mistake. But let me also caveat this with. Yeah, I, I jumped on this landmine with Mason Miller in his first couple of starts. I have a history of, of getting a bit too bullish on these young arms that have high upside. Uh, they're still young arms, and there's still variance with them, and these are still big league lineups. Every single one of these hitters has been in the big leagues and has made it here, and it's more difficult to get to the big leagues as a hitter than it is a pitcher. Uh, I think that's yeah, pretty universally accepted. So uh, the stuff can play. He, he's got high 90s fastball here he's got he throws really really hard similar to mason miller who we'll get to um uh, and and plus arsenal he, he's got plenty to work through the oakland athletics here uh this team has been dreadful against right he's just an aggregate so far this year 25 percent k rate 91 wrc plus a little sticky there creating a little bit but just a 136 iso so not hitting for any power and not hitting the ball over the wall 089 ground ball to fly ball, so a lot of softish contact, popping balls up, not a lot of hard contact on the barrel. So um, I think Bryce Miller here at the stone min at 4,000 per pitcher is excellent, and the market kind of agrees here. He's seeing a lot of ownership here so far, and this number really hasn't moved in the last couple of hours. So um, you can play him. I'm very intrigued to, to get some pieces of Bryce Miller tonight. Um, probably come in with the field because I'm not wild about eating – you know, 25 and, and 40% ownership uh, on a guy that's already pretty popular. Um, so I'd probably come in about with the field and, and get my exposure here, but uh, this stuff will certainly play. Mason Miller on the other side also seeing heavy ownership, and that's really unfortunate. I was hoping that his last outing would keep this ownership down, but um, it looks like that's not the case. 5700 for him. The price is elevated, too. He was, what, 53 or something in his last start? That's fine, uh, and and I don't really care. The stuff certainly plays for him also. Still a, a very, uh, I mean, it, it, not enough data here. Uh, very early in the career for Miller, so we can't really take anything out of any of these aggregate numbers just yet, uh, or barrel rates, or, or even um, value numbers in the arsenal. What we can take out of the early numbers here is the early strike one rate. 47% is very worrisome, and I don't care if your stuff plays. I, like, I'm as bullish on Mason Miller as anybody, but like you have to be able to throw strikes, and if you cannot throw it over the plate early in the count, I don't care how good your stuff is. It, these are big league hitters, and these are big league lineups. It's going to be difficult, and this is still the Mariners. They haven't quite shown up just yet at just a 97 WRC plus so far, 26% K rate, 154 ISO, not hitting for as much power as we expected, not making as much hard contact as we really expected this lineup to in the early part of the, or coming into the season, I suppose. Average WOBA, 
and you know average production so far so uh you can go after them because this kid still throws 100 102 or whatever uh with a wipeout slider very hard at 87 and a good cutter as well change up not throwing it a lot and it, this is going to have to be a work in progress for him uh if but again with it, the same as as Bryce Miller here um it's it's just command that we have to be concerned with with Mason Miller um but we can get to pieces here definitely probably once again just come in with the field um I'd be more apt to come in over the field on Mason Miller here than I would be with Bryce Miller even though there's a $1,700 price difference uh probably not super necessary to eke out that extra 1700 in a lot of scenarios on a full 12 gamer uh, plenty of value pieces that you can get to to make this extra 1700 happen if you had to. Uh, but the, the projections are down here at, at these price tags. It's very rare that you see it, a 15-point projection for a guy at 55, 57, 4,000 um, down in this price range. So uh, give me all the pitching in this game, and I don't really want anything. If you want to play some some offense, I would play Seattle because Julio is likely to be back tonight. Uh, dealing with just like some back tightness, I think. And the rest of the guys are at playable price tags now. Ty France is down to 4,300 finally. Jared Kelnick at 43. He's in the three hole now. Uh, Gino Suarez stinks anymore. He's at 37. Tay Oscar at 4,000 4, flat. Cal Raleigh got to pay for it a little bit at 41. But um, Taylor Trammell came up and hit a granny in like his first at bat um, after his activation. So. They've got some guys that can make it a little bit difficult on Mason Miller. If you are going to play anybody, I'd, I'd play them just because they're a better lineup than the A's. But I don't really want offense no matter what. So let's get to the last game here. Strom on the mound for the Phillies and Urias on the mound for the Dodgers. And this is a playable price here for Matt Strom. It's not super exciting. Um, but if you land on a 6,900 here and target the Dodgers with a guy that's got a very high strikeout rate this year, uh, 30%. And obviously, a lot of this is coming out of the bullpen for Boston last year, but it did, in the early going here, he's been fantastic. Really worried about pitch count for Matt Strom, but he can get the, if he can throw whatever it is, 80 something, 85 pitches, I'd be super stoked about that. He's only done that once this season, though 61, 59, 67, 82, and 60 pitches in each of his five starts. And we're just kind of throwing out the first one since he was just, he wasn't stretched out then. Um, so they're not really letting him go. He's gone five and a third in each of his last two outings. One of which he struck out 11 against Colorado, struck out five against Seattle in his last start. Uh, two really good outings there. So the K stuff is there. The suppression can be there. I don't really like going after the Dodgers, but I prefer to do that with a guy that's got some high K stuff. 75 WRC plus for the Dodgers against lefties is a worrisome number. Um, now, they are they did activate Miggy Rojas. No idea if he's going to actually be in the lineup. He probably will be since they get a lefty tonight. They do their platoon shenanigans down here in L.A. Um, but Mookie, Freddie, Will Smith, Chris Taylor, uh, they'll definitely be in the lineup. Max Muncy, sure. Uh, not our favorite spot to go after Muncy. Mun Max Muncy against a lefty, but they can platoon a little bit with uh, with a Vargas, Miggy Rojas, and a Trace Thompson as well if they choose to instead of the uh, Jason Hayward, David Peralta shenanigans. So if you want to go after the Dodgers, yeah, they're striking out a 28% clip so far against lefties. Now, they're, they're still walking at a 12% clip, so I'm not crazy about going after the Dodgers because I think it's more noisy, this 28% K rate, than a 12% walk rate. That still means that you're patient at the plate and you're taking pitches and you're not beating yourself and chasing out of the strike zone, uh, even though the, the strikeout rate is elevated. So um, still dangerous going after the Dodgers here, but if you land on a 6,900 because they're still striking out, with with Matt Strom here, the, the K stuff has been really, really strong. I think this is okay. Strike one rate, a uh, little bit of an issue still, but I think this stuff is, is played, and if you land on this, I think this is fine. Um, not my favorite going after the Dodgers. I'd probably rather get up to 
maybe a, maybe a Walker or Tyler Wells or something, um, some something in that range. But I think this is fine if you want to play this maybe on the late slate or something. I think that's okay. 9,100 on the mound for Urias at uh, at 20% ownership nearly. I think this is kind of aggressive, to be honest. He's been terrible in his last two starts. Um, not like I'm super worried about Urias, but uh, this is the Phillies, and this is a hard lineup, and they're getting their best hitter back, Bryce Harper, tonight. So um, the main problem with Urias, it's not in in opposite-handed platoon. The numbers there have always been great. It's production to same-handed hitters. It's to lefties. 263 Woba with a 195 average allowed. Those numbers are fine, but it's a 194 ISO and a 1.8 homers per nine to the left side. He gives up a lot of power on the barrel to the lefties. And this has been kind of the book on him for the last couple of seasons. He needs to develop out this change up a little bit more. They'll help him neutralize a bit more of the production to the right side. Not that it's worrisome or anything just yet, but he needs something else against the lefties. And it's he's trying to throw the cutter here a little bit. He's got to introduce the slider, similar to what Kershaw did Early in his career, uh, he made the transition from mostly curveball, and he added in the slider, and it it prolonged his career probably by, I mean, it, Kershaw's Kershaw, but uh, probably by a good few seasons, especially considering the injuries that he, he's gone through. So uh, i really like to see Urias add in the slider, and that would give him more wipeout stuff against the left side. Not that the K stuff isn't there necessarily. He always throws strikes and stays off the barrel, but it's it's a little concerning that this has persisted now for about three seasons. Um, two lefties. It, it's the four-seamer here that he just pipes to left-hander sometimes. He just makes a mistake, and, and it, it can go a long way. It's a big fly ball right to the left side of the plate. And that is um, Kyle Schwarber and Bryce Harper territory. So if you want to play a late slate I mean you can play Harper on on the main slate for sure 5100 that's a pretty good price he's going to be way north of that by the end of the season I can guarantee you that Schwarber at 56 I'm less enthused about but um do you want to play Trey Turner at 5800 tonight probably not on the main slate 48 for Castellanos probably not 52 for JTR probably not so not great stacking the Phillies here against a really good arm but 9100 uh, I think this ownership is probably a bit too high for this matchup in general. Uh, the Phillies just don't strike out a whole hell of a lot. And even though I respect Urias, really like the Arsenal, uh, I'm not super crazy about this. I, I'm not going to X him from the pools or anything, but um, not my favorite going after this. So I prefer mostly Strom. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you can play both the Dodgers and the Phillies here, but two pretty good arms on the on the mound, and I'm not wild about going after either of them. Um you can play some Urias, you know, don't get me wrong. The stuff still plays, and, and I love this kid. But uh, on full slate on this particular one, I think there's some other arms I think I'd rather get to. Okay, so we are done. That is the breakdown for today. Um, we went kind of long, I assume, but 12 games, um, and that's going to kind of happen. So let's go through stacks real quick. Cleveland and the Yankees. Uh, no offense really here. Uh, I like both of these arms here. Certainly Cole. Give me some Bybee on the mound as well. Um, might be tough to get to with 6,500, but it, I think that's fine. Give me the Cubs against Trevor Williams. And maybe a little Wes on the mound too. Really kind of off the Nats here. Uh, Minnesota almost exclusively against Michael Kopech. Uh, till he gets it figured out. Joe Ryan definitely. Um, no White Sox pretty much at all. Toronto and Boston. <clears throat> I don't really want much of Boston. And sure, you can play Toronto. Uh, I think Tanner Hawk's a little overpriced here. You can take some shorts on him. That's fine. They're expensive, though. Baltimore and Kansas City. Give me Baltimore, definitely. You can play a short stack at Kansas City as well against Tyler Wells. Uh, but you can play Tyler Wells, too. I think he's uh, certainly playable. Angels in St. Louis. Offense only here for me. Um, would prefer... Ooh, I don't know. Would prefer the Angels, I think. But uh, the historically better hitters against lefties are definitely on on the cards here uh arizona and texas probably just the diamondbacks here i think maybe a little bit of john gray probably not going to land on him but um zach allen definitely no san francisco i think tonight give me hunter brown and the astros i like the astros a pretty good bit against de uh milwaukee of course probably no rockies you could play freddie peralta since he in san diego 
probably no Cincy, maybe a, a, a Jake Fraley or something against Michael Waugh. You could stack them. It's like a super off the board stack, uh, like well down the list in terms of probabilities. But um, you can go after Waka. He gives up some power. You can play Waka too, since Cincy is just kind of bad. Uh, Seattle and Oakland pitching only for me here. Um, in most scenarios, maybe some short Seattle pieces as hedges or something against Mason Miller. Um, maybe a, a an Oakland piece or, or two against some Bryce Miller. But uh, I really am excited to watch these two young arms here tonight. Philly and the Dodgers, no offense really. And probably just like some Matt Strom. Yes, yeah, some Urias because I like the kid, but uh, not overly crazy about it. So that's it. Um, we've gone long here, but keep an eye out for the projection updates. We will have pushes throughout the day. Uh, and good luck to everybody punting tonight on this huge Monday main. There are Tuesday main.